Hi, my name is Jessica and I'm an educator at the Living Coast Discovery Center. Did you know your patio or yard can be a wildlife hotspot? There are steps you can take to support native wildlife. Today, we're gonna to talk about cultivating habitats to attract wildlife to your own yard. San Diego's native wildlife is diverse. There are several species of plants and animals that call San Diego home. But for them to thrive here, we need to protect their habitats. One thing we can do is create natural spaces in our yard to ensure that plants and animals of San Diego thrive. Creating a nature scape helps reverse some of the human impacts on our natural environment. Here are five elements that your wildlife garden should include. Food. Native plants provide nectar, seeds, nuts, fruits, berries, foliage, and pollen for a variety of wildlife. Water. All animals need water to survive, and some need it for bathing or breeding as well. If possible, make sure it is flowing water to avoid mosquitoes. Cover. Wildlife needs places to find shelter from bad weather and places to hide from predators or to stalk prey. Shady areas and places with perches, like taller trees, are a great way to add cover. Places to raise young. Wildlife needs resources to reproduce and keep their species going. Some species have totally different habitat needs in their juvenile phase than they do as adults. A great addition to your outdoor space could be something like a bird box or a bat box. Sustainable practices. How you manage your garden can have an effect on the health of the soil, air, water, and habitat for native wildlife, as well as the human community. Create hydrozones where plants with similar water needs are grouped and irrigated together. Separate low water users from high water users. Collect rainwater from roofs in rain barrels for later use. Rainwater harvesting can help reduce water bills and the community reliance on imported water from an outside region. Alternatives to sustainably managing pests. Learn more about integrated pest management, a system where you can use chemicals as a last resort. The first thing you do is tolerate some level of pests because that will bring in natural predators. Second, Prevent the things that eat your plants from causing too much damage by arranging your plants in such a way that bugs can't reach it. Combine the above practices so that you don't need to use chemicals. Hi, my name is Judy Linser. Welcome to Little Pond La Mesa. Uh, this is my backyard wildlife sanctuary and I love sharing it with people. I love the concept um, that I've created here. Uh, I also work for the California Native Plant Society. I've been the Native Plant Society tour director, um, as well as a workshop director, and my garden is about 95% natives, which is a wonderful opportunity to create a tremendous amount of habitat for birds and other wildlife to utilize, lots of plants for pollinators, butterflies, bees, praying mantises, uh, bats, actually, um, just lots of different um, animals are found here. I've also had some bird predators, uh, great blue herons, great egrets, and even an osprey. Uh, just last week I had a cooper's hawk here. It gives a whole new meaning to bird feeding. For many years we used the pond when my kids were little. However, when they got a little bit older I was the only person using the pool. I do laps maybe about ten times a year. So about five years ago, um, I had the idea to turn the pool into a pond and I never looked back. This is definitely something that I have fully embraced. Um, there was never a time when I said, oh, I'm gonna go have some tea or a glass of wine by the pool. But once it became a pond, I spent a ton of time out here. Um, so basically it was out with the toxic chemicals and in with the algae. Um, it took about three weeks before I started introducing fish. And actually within a week, there were little dragonfly larvae swimming around that quickly from when the um, toxic chemicals were out. And I had over a hundred dragonflies hatch uh, just about two months after I um, started this project. 
So introduced koi, most of them are rescue koi. There are also a couple of turtles in here, some uh, rescue red-eared sliders, as well as three other species of fish. I have some hyphen sharks, um, some platys, and some minnows. And you can see lots of vegetation. The vegetation helps with um, oxygenation and uh, keeping the water clean, as well as the waterfall, which you saw earlier, also helps with oxygenation. Well, one of the main reasons that I decided to do a pool to pond is because it's really creating a ton of habitat. So there's a great water source. Um, animals can come up and drink from the waterfall. I see birds in the waterfall constantly, as well as, again, the backyard bird predators that are native here too. Um, in the summertime, there are bats flying over the pond and they're also, obviously the bats are fantastic for eating insects um, and ridding the area of insects. I also do have fish in here that are able to eat mosquitoes and mosquito larvae. Um, so that does take care of the whole mosquito issue. So I sit here on this bench and eat just about all of my meals out here. I'm also very popular because friends like to come over and enjoy the pond as well. And um, it's also a swimming pond. People often ask me the question, but do you go in? Um, absolutely, I do go in. I um, sometimes put on a, a wetsuit and I go in and um, cut the vegetation. And I also put on my bathing suit and I do laps. Um, so it absolutely is a swimming pond. This concept is very um, popular in places like Australia and Europe where they do have swimming ponds. And um, my idea is to really share this concept with other people so that they can um, use the pond as well for swimming and also have the enjoyment. Pollination so is the process of pollen moving from one flower to another flower of the same species. Now pollination can happen by wind, water, or even self-pollination. Almost all flowering plants need to be pollinated. So it is important that bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds are protected because these are our big pollinators. Pollinators have evolved alongside our native plants, which are adapted for our local growing seasons, climate, and soil. Different pollinators require different plants. Hummingbirds sip nectar from long tubular honeysuckle flowers, while green sweet beets prefer more open-faced sunflowers. Non-native plants may not provide pollinators with enough nectar or pollen, or may be inedible to butterfly or moth caterpillars. Non-native plants may not provide enough pollen or nectar for some of our animals, or may be inedible. Biologists fear several butterfly and bumblebee species have disappeared from parts of their range, including the once common western bumblebee. Why are pollinators in trouble? It appears as though habitat loss and pesticide poisoning are the leading causes of the population decline. We need to do our part to support pollinators by creating pollinator-friendly gardens. Bees, butterflies, moths, hummingbirds, beetles, wasps, and even flies pollinate flowers. But bee species pollinate flowers more often than any other group, even birds and butterflies. If you want to attract hummingbirds to your garden, deck, or patio, you can hardly do better than that of a monkey flower. They come in a variety of colors from reds, pinks, and yellows, and always look great when flowering. Hummingbirds love monkey flowers because they are a great source of nectar. The birds will show a slight preference for the red variants, not necessarily because they like the color red, but because bees don't and they tend to leave this plant alone, therefore leaving more nectar for the hummingbirds. Native bees of San Diego are quite unique, many of which bear little resemblance to the honeybees and bumblebees we know. The biggest are grape size and glossy black, while the tiniest could sit on the head of a pin or slip unnoticed into a flower. Some are iridescent jewel shades of blue and green, while others are rusty red. There are more than 350 different native bee species, and estimates that there are as many as 600 species in the region. Sweet bees, carpenter bees, and mining bees are just a few of our native species. Carpenter bees like wood piles for nesting and shelter. 
some bees like exposed soil because they nest underground. So leave a patch of your garden undercovered. Now that we've talked a little bit about pollinators, let's talk about the right plants to choose for your garden. Here is a list of native plant species that attract pollinators but require minimal water. This is the California buckwheat. This plant has little clusters of flowers that butterflies and moths like to visit. In the spring, this plant has small clusters of white and pink flowers, and as the heat and drought of the summer emerge, the flowers change color to orange, red, and then brown. This flat top buckwheat is a nectar plant for the endangered Hermes copper butterfly. The chaparral yucca sends flowers up on a tall stalk. That's an indicator that this plant will bloom once in its life and then die. A lot of energy goes into growing a tall stalk so that pollinators can find it. When it dies, it drops down and plants seeds further from the base of the parent plant. Each species of yucca is pollinated by a unique species of yucca moth. Other pollinators may also visit this flower in order to get nectar, but they won't actually pollinate it. Ecologists speculate that other pollinators visiting this flower may help prevent the yucca moth caterpillars from over-consuming the yucca flowers. The San Diego sunflower, like all sunflowers, is a cluster of many flowers put together. So when a pollinator visits one location, it's actually pollinating all the little flowers in the center of the disc. It's also pollinated by many different things like flies, bees, and moths. So here we are in my backyard habitat. Native plants live here. Um, so native plants seem to be a wonderful addition to any garden. First of all, they're low water, of course, because they're California natives, and they also create so much habitat. The difference between just a drought tolerant plant and a California native plant is that you can have a drought tolerant plant, but a California native plant evolved with California native animals and again, pollinators, so it really does attract a ton of wildlife. So if you look here, there's a beautiful sage and um, some bees buzzing around. This is California sage brush, which has my favorite fragrance in the backyard. Um, on the slope, you can see some California sunflowers, other sages, there's bladder pods. Um, and this is an oak that started out about six inches high 10 years ago. And oaks a lot of people don't know this, but they attract moths and butterflies. There are hundreds of different kinds of moths and butterflies that utilize, <laughs> there's a hummingbird, that utilize oaks um, as a habitat plant as well. So um, I do have a couple of uh, coast live oaks in the backyard as well, plus some scrub oaks at the back and some toy on and um, lots of buckwheats. Just around every corner is a, a different surprise. Most of my plants, this is my front yard, and most of my plants come from three local nurseries. Uh, one is Musa Creek, which actually delivers to nurseries all around the county. The other is Tree of Life Nursery, which is up in San Juan Pastrano, and what used to be Recon, but now is Native West down in the South Bay. So most of the plants have come through there, also through plant sharing. Um, the California Native Plant Society has a native garden committee, and we visit different people's native gardens. We do a lot of garden sharing that way as well. So as far as native plant maintenance, because I, use, um, I don't use a lot of water, I don't irrigate, therefore there are very little, or very few weeds. So maintenance is pretty easy in that regard. And I have a landscape company uh, called Restoring California, Vince and Daniel Bellino. They come a couple of times a year to help me with some of the bigger trimming and um, so got some guidance in those areas. But for the most part, I take care of the garden completely by myself. You always see me um, with clippers. I, I actually have clippers in my mailbox, pull them out, do some clipping here and there. Um, and again, the occasional weed pulling, not much of that, mostly just trimming. And I'd also like to point out this uh, recycled bottle path that I love. Um, it's recycled beer and wine bottles and it was a great sustainable way to create something. Uh, one of the things I also love about this path is I really want to invite passers-by and neighbors to walk the garden and experience the garden. So I want them to take a look around, see the sages, smell them, touch them, and get some ideas about what it's like to be immersed in nature. 
and how a native garden, even though it's hardly irrigated, could actually be quite lush. For beginners, you can start small. I would suggest getting on the CNPS or California Native Plant Society.org website and specifically the CNPS sd.org website. There's lots of different resources out there. I highly recommend Calscape, which is a wonderful website which gives you the different native plants that live within your zone. Um, it tells you when they bloom, what kind of mulch to use, how to plant them, what kind of pollinators they attract. So again, calscape.org is fantastic um, and a great way to get started. Thanks so much for coming to visit my native landscape and my wild area, including my uh, backyard haven and wildlife sanctuary, pool to pond. Um, again, I would encourage anyone who's considering doing something like this to just jump right in, start getting your feet wet, get some native plants in, use your resources, and have fun with it. Wildlife needs our help. By planting a native wildlife garden, you can ensure native species thrive. Just remember the five essentials to planting a native wildlife garden.